Father, we want to thank you for yet another opportunity for us to come before you, to learn of you. <laughs> Out of all men, I find myself to be inadequate. But Lord, your grace is what is sufficient to communicate your truth. I ask that you will speak to everyone, including myself. Help us to pay attention to your words and help us to take to be rooted and grounded in your word. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we continuing off uh, our James chapter 2. And uh, last week we stopped at the royal law, the royal law, which was found in uh, James chapter 2 and verses 8. So um, when we talk about royal law, it's, it's called royal because almost every other law hinges on this law. And if you are able to apply it, it puts us in a position where we are most likely to be in right standing with God. So uh, James chapter two and verse eight, let's quickly read from the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew. So in Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 to 40. Uh, Matthew 22, 35, it says, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as thyself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophet are based on these two commands. Let's quickly read Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, before I make a comment on this. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. And it reads, for the whole law can be summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is not really saying anything contradictory to what Christ has said, because Jesus said, the most important is love the Lord your God with all of you. The second is equally important to eat. So whichever one you pick is the same thing because they are equal. When you say one plus one is equal to two, either you pick two, or you pick one plus one, they are both and the same. So Paul is not contradictory about this. Uh, so also James, we should keep it at the back of our mind, is addressing concerns primarily now at this point in chapter two among believers. Remember in uh, James chapter two, in ch chapter one, verse two, uh, sorry, James chapter one, verse 27, it reads, pure and undefined religion before God and the Father is this, to take care of orphans and widow in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted in the world. But when he started chapter two, he start by saying, for if there should, if, for if there should come into your assembly a man into your assembly among you, so now he has said, we must show love. We must help everybody. But it now says in your assembly, it narrows down the audience. So narrowing down the audience, that will make us to also consider reading uh, from the book of John, chapter 13 and verse 34 and 35. Verse 34 reads, uh, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciple. So is when Jesus said a new commandment, is it like entirely new? No, because it's narrowing it down. This is just addressing his disciples, your, yourself. 
So the same thing, uh, um, James in chapter two, when it gets to verse uh, uh, eight now, is narrowing it down to us that among yourself, what should you be doing? So when we now look at the royal law, and I don't want us to always look it in a third person perspective. For example, if I'm talking about royal law, I should be thinking that uh, uh, if Bara uh, Rotimi should really be showing me love by finding me around where, uh, since he's living uh, in Oyo State in Nigeria, he should be able to find a wrong bear for me that I will eat. And if he's not getting me that arrow bear, you know, that brother is really not showing, Bushmeat, I mean, he's really, he's really not showing me love. No, we should not consider somebody else. We should, when you talk about royal law, we must consider ourselves. And why do I say we must consider ourselves? So, what I wrote down in my notes, application of royal law is from your point of view, not the other. How do I, did I come to this conclusion? This is from Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. I might not read everything, but there is a particular verse where I'm gonna stop. Now, now, one day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking this question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his action, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That question led to the parable of the Good Samaritan. But I want us to pay attention. A Jewish man was traveling. This is Luke 10 30. Jesus replied, A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, first, pay attention. Verse 30 says, a Jewish man. A Jewish man take, give utmost respect to the priest. So when the priest saw this man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road. A priest also love a Jewish man because they bring in their tithes, they bring, come and do their sacrifices. It's a mutually beneficial um, uh, relationship between a Jewish man and a priest. Both of them are benefiting from their relationship. So now if the Jewish man commits a sin, it goes to the priest, the priest take whatever he brings for sacrifice and offer it to God. We know the priests, they eat the fatling of the cow, they enjoy a tent of the tithes and all these things. So when you look at it, now pay attention. Verse 32, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Remember, a temple assistant is the one that this Jewish man would have met, would have called that I need to see the priest. When he brings his bull, ram, tortudo, whatever he has for sacrifice, these temple assistants are the one that will take it, drag it inside, and get the priest, prepare everything. So these were not strangers to one another. And the temple assistant, they are happy when they see a Jewish man showing up at the temple because they know that something is going to drop and from what drops, they benefit. But here is why I said, royal law is from your point of view, not the other. Now verse 33 says, then a despised Samaritan came along. See, that statement first is what settles the matter. The Jewish people despised Samaritans. They don't want to see them. They hate them. They do not want to have anything to do with them. Now you understand why the woman in, by the well in John chapter 4 was saying that 
but you Jews says because they are like the elite but the Samaritans were the despise so when you look at it now and this despised Samaritan that the Jewish man on a normal day would not have anything to do with him now when the despised Samaritan came along and when he saw the man he felt compassion for him Going over to him, the Samaritan suited his wound with olive oil and wine and bandaged it. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where they took care of him. So, application of the royal law is not the man to is not from the view of the man that was wounded. It is from the view of the people they were supposed to respond. Because if that Samaritan should consider it from his own point of view, or from the view of the man on the floor, he should never address the finger. But he took it from his own point of view that this is somebody injured. And it is, Jesus used two people that do not play with each other to explain who is your neighbor to us. And that is why this is a real law. It's from your point of view. Not that people hurt you, and you think that, he, why can't he love me? No, it's from your point of view. And I want to make a statement, and please, this statement, if you have comment about it, we can discuss it at the end of the Bible study. I don't want this to take us offline from the Bible study. And I'm going to first read what I have here, because applying royal law must never make us to shy away from justice. There's a story I saw two days ago, or maybe yesterday. My cousin raped me, and my mom did not allow me to call police. So that case was shared to somebody uh, that does live broadcast on Facebook, and he came to share it. Ask that same woman, if the rapist was not a cousin to her daughter, what would be her response? So application of royal law does not mean that we should condone evil. Because you see, that cousin that raped his own cousin, she has just given him more tools to rape somebody else. The next person is going to rape will not be a cousin. Maybe a classmate, a colleague, or a strange girl walking in the park. So please, whenever we find somebody committing a crime, don't think of anything else than crime must be stopped and find the appropriate authorities to stop the perpetration of crime. So what scripture is saying is not about crime. It is simply about somebody in need. And this book of James is also, this chapter two is also going to elaborate on this scenario. So uh, last week uh, or the upper week, I can't remember, we read Galatians chapter six, verse 10, which we're gonna read again, Galatians 6, 10. But it was, we read it because of a question from brother Ola, I remembered very well. It says, therefore, whenever we have opportunity we should do good to all, to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. The first premise of our doing good is to everyone. If you are traveling on the highway, uh, you find a car accident and you feel you have help to offer them. Excellent. You can, you don't need to know them to do that only when it is safe, not in countries where they could use that as a trap to arrest you. And you are going to see, the Bible does not leave us in dark spot because what to do lies in our hand. It is not scripted that this is exactly what you must do. And like we always say, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Let that, along with common sense, walk uh, with us in every situation. But this will be explained as we proceed today. 
So I've just taken my first five, 10 minutes to talk more about the royal law. Uh, now let me read uh, from verse nine. It's actually interesting uh, how James wrote this uh, sets of passages. So now I read from uh, James, I'll just read from eight. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. So how am I guilty of breaking the law? For the person who keeps all the law except one is as guilty as, is as, is as a person who has broken all of God's law. For the same God, who says you must not commit adultery, also said you must not commit murder. So if you murder someone, but do not commit adultery, you are still breaking the law. So uh, uh, James is bringing us to a point for us to see that the entire law, and that is why no one was able to keep it. It's like, every, it's like we are hanging on a chain. You know, a chain is a set of rings connected together. The moment one of those rings breaks, at any point it breaks, the chain is going to let loose and you are going to fall. That is how the law of Moses worked. And that was why nobody was able to keep it. So what James is trying to make us understand is as simple as being partiality might be, being partial might be, I mean, you might look at it like, uh, I'm not an adulterer. I don't kill people. I only tell little lies. A sin is a sin, though the consequences of sin are different. If you happen to, to lie, even if you are caught, you might only suffer some shame that, oh, you're a liar. If you happen to go and sleep with another man's wife and you are caught, the man might kill you. That's the consequences of sin. Even if he doesn't kill you, if you have a side chick, or if I have a side chick, let me say to myself, and she gets pregnant. I have to take care of an extra child. Or I pay child support. If you happen to kill someone, you might get away in some countries. But in some nations of the world, you are going to be in jail. So the consequences are different. But before God, a sin is a sin. So James wants us to consider being partial as a sin, as much as you commit murder, you commit adultery. We shouldn't try to lessen the threshold for ourselves. And that's why the case I was telling you when a cousin raped a woman's child and she said, don't call police because the child is my, the, the, how do they call people that commit crime? I can't remember the word now. Can anybody help me with? The, the criminal or perpetrator. The, the perpetrator or criminal is a cousin. What if it's a stranger? Will she also tell the daughter not to call police? What if the person is their neighbor, next door neighbor? Will she also say, keep quiet? So these are things we need to consider in our heart. So for the same God, this is James chapter 2, verse 11, who said, you must not commit murder, also said you must, you must not commit adultery, also said you must not commit murder. So if you murder someone, but you do not commit adultery, you are still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others, but if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Okay, let us stop here now. This, if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you, is the reason why some people only choose 
to, to do charity. But before that statement, what James said is that, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. What does it mean? Another translation says, is a law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy rejoices over judgment. Verse 12 in another translation says, so speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So what do we mean when we get, when we talk about the law of liberty? So law of liberty, uh, do not work, law and liberty do not work against one another. So now to be in context, a Christian obedience to God, for without the law, there is no liberty. For example, the principle of law is to care for the poor and orphans and the widow. That's what the law states. The principle is in loving one's neighbor as yourself. Therefore, as long as one loves his neighbor, he needs no law to feed his brother who has no job. So what this is trying to say is that you have liberty to do what you want to do. The law is be merciful to the poor, to the orphans, and to the widow. But you don't go about looking for poor, widows, and orphans with the goal that I want to fulfill the law. How the Bible wants us to act is, I want to love them to feed them. Because by the time you are thinking of fulfilling the law, you are trying to justify yourself by what you are doing. So our position should be, I love this person. I don't want him to remain hungry. And the little I have, I offer. I love this widow. The little I have to support, I offer. Not because that, oh, I want to fulfill the law of God. Let me go and look for widow and offer. So we are not to be in a position while we are hunting down for the poor, for the widows, and for the orphan. You know why? If we get engrossed so much in that, we'll be blinded to many other things we are supposed to do. So the approach that James wants us to look at it is that you have the liberty, the freedom to do what you want to do. But do it from the point of view of I love them as my neighbor. And remember when he's using the word as your neighbor, someone that despises you. Like for example, maybe someone in your street doesn't greet you, doesn't say hello to you. But one day you found them that is raining, is drinking seriously, and they are by the side of the road, the bus is not coming or there's bus cancellation. Offer them a ride if they, if they care to take your help. Whatever the situation, the scripture is not giving us accurate pinpoint in this situation, do this, in this, do that. We are, the, we are not robots. We are the ones to decide how to respond. So that's why uh, my note here says, for as long as one loves his neighbor, he needs no law to feed his brother who has no job. Though there is no specific command to either buy or produce food to feed one's brother, the law of love is sufficient to move us into action. Love, we should be motivated by love and not by law. So before I go to verse 13 that talks about without mercy and no mercy, do we have any question on law of liberty? how we should apply this, any comment, contribution? <coughs> Anybody? Okay, I can continue with verse 13. 
Verse 13 says, for judgment will be without mercy. When it is time for God to judge, it will be without mercy. Uh, for judgment will be without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And mercy rejoices over judgment. You know, it's almost like, it sounds like it's contradictory. Mercy now rejoices over judgment. But you say judgment will be without mercy. So let us try and break down this statement. So um, the condition, if I'm going to read, give me one second. So first I'm going to read um, Proverbs 21, 13. Whosoever stoppeth his ear at the crowd of the poor, he also will cry himself, but will not be heard. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, verse 26 to 27. With the mercy thou will show yourself merciful, and with the forward thou will show yourself unsavory. You see, when we look at this, when it is time for God to judge, the condition of receiving mercy in judgment is to exercise mercy towards others. In context, mercy must be shown towards the poor and mercy only comes from the art of compassion. Those who do not mercy, uh, manifest mercy towards their fellow man will receive no mercy. Why should God not consider those that do not show their fellow man with mercy? Why should God Though I have faith in God, I believe in him. But if I don't have mercy on people, how is that a problem with this God? I'm going to use mercy rejoices over judgment to explain the first part. So the law is that when you break one, you are condemned. But you see, all, all men, have violated that law because none of us is without sin. So we are all, in like in Romans 6, 23, we are all doomed because we have all transgressed the law. But thanks be to God for his mercy, which he poured out on us. When he poured out his mercy on us, since that great mercy has been put forward, now we have obtained mercy. And the judgment that we are due for, that is due to us, has been put aside because of the mercy of God. So now the mercy of God, which we receive through Christ, is why the Bible is saying that mercy will rejoice over judgment. Judgment on his own is without mercy. God wants to judge everybody. The same measure. You have sinned, you have done this. You are a sinner, you are condemned to die. But you see, mercy triumphed over it. Because God himself made himself the mercy that would triumph over it through the sacrifice of Jesus. And this is why salvation is very important. Why we must never joke with the point of, am I really saved? Is that brother really saved? Is that sister genuinely saved? Because by the time we are genuinely saved, it guarantees that the judgment that we deserve, God has put it on Christ. And now we have obtained mercy. So now that we that were condemned to die, we obtained mercy. That the time the mercy was even being paid, we were, yet, we were still sinners. When Christ died for us, we were yet sinners. But someday we woke up into that realization and came into Christ. Why can't we just extend the same gray, a mercy to others on behalf of God? 
not to die for them like Christ died for us, but we can do little by just showing them mercy because we ourselves have obtained mercy. If not for the mercy of God, I, I don't even know what would have, where I would be, not to talk of what would have happened to me personally. Apart from being saved and having the assurance of eternal life, the ideas I had in my mind, the thoughts, the, the plans I was thinking for myself, they are not plans that we take, we put anyone to, to be straight in life. But it was the mercy of God that caught me. At that point, I was to take a turn that I was never to take. And if God was that merciful, that while I was yet a sinner, he died for me. I think to, to mimic the one I confessed to believe in, I should be able to show a little. And that is what James is expecting from us as believers. So one of the things which I have here as well, an unmerciful bro brother, does not understand the grace and mercy of God. He doesn't understand. Because when we understand the grace and mercy of God, we would have mercy over every other person. And I think it is important for us to maintain mercy in our hearts for others. And when I'm talking about being merciful to people, it is when, in fact, James is also going to explain what it means by having mercy to people. But you see, this will now make what Jesus said to be true in the book of Matthew. I think it's from chapter 22 or 23. That when people come, oh, master, and he said, I do not know you. He said, I was in prison. You didn't visit me. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. You saw me hungry. You didn't feed me. You say, ah, ah, Abba, Abba. If we, how could we see you, Jesus, Lord of the Savior? And we won't save you. We won't clothe you. We won't feed you. He said, in as much as you have not done this to any of my brethren. So when you, when you look at it, if Jesus was really standing on the street, trust me, a million people, if he, if he says, I'm stranded, I, I know minimum there will be about five private jets leaving Nigeria to go and rescue him. But you see, let an ordinary human being be stranded. Aren't you surprised that you heard that people are being kidnapped? No question. But you heard that somebody in an organization is kidnapped. And the head of the organization is not saying that, oh, the government must do something. They will mobilize everything. You see, the scripture is clear. And the scripture cannot be broken. We know already we don't need to mention they are transgressors. Because they only speak only when it affects them. But when it affects others, they don't care. And the position that God wants us to take is for us to be merciful unto others. Any question, comment, contribution? to be cleared about um, this, right. that, like showing mercy to someone who has uh, committed a crime against you doesn't mean that you you cannot go ahead to hand the person over to the police or something. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I've said it earlier. When it comes to crime, please don't take a second thought. There is nothing to think about in the area of a crime. Don't. There is no let me ponder over it. If a crime is committed, let the person be committed to the authorities. You Even see, if the, the person is asking you for mercy, please forgive see, me. Don't call police. The, the danger of doing that is you are putting the next person at risk. There will be a next victim. So it is better that we stop 
they bleed at that point. In fact, you are showing, because the net, okay, so for example, a thief comes into my house and I came out with a gun. He pleaded for mercy and I let him go. There are two scenarios. If he goes into another person's house, they might not ask questions and just shoot him dead. He has lost his life. So you would have shown mercy to the person by handing him over to police and they put him in prison. He will still have his life. Second, if the person goes ahead to the next house and they are harmless, he could kill them. So you have not shown mercy to your neighbor, who is the person you don't know that will still be a victim of that armed robber. So please, when it comes to crime, don't think about it. Just handle crime with the law of the land where you live. No questions asked, nothing to think about. Please. Thank you, man, for bringing that up. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah, concerning what uh, one of our studies said just now, uh, in a situation uh, like an incident that happens to me, that I, I, I gave my car to the mechanic to, to fix it. And I gave him some I amount of money to do that. Well, unfortunately, <clears throat> he didn't do that. So some elderly people now involved in the case that I should, I should just forget about it. That um, I should just do that is one of those things I impart that I, I have to do in his life. That I should just forgive him. And on his own, he is not remorseful with what he did. He has never called to say sorry, but people are still calling. Even as of today, somebody still coming to plead. They pleaded on his behalf that I should forgive him, that I should show mercy on him. So in such a case, in such scenario, what should I do? Thank you. All right. Uh, number one, I am not Holy Spirit. Uh, so I'm going to give you answer. And I'm not saying that this is what you must do. So this is what you have not done. This one I know very well. And what had really happened is they have applied, even you, when you said some elders, you have applied tradition into the scenario. And when you bring tradition into the scenario, it's, it's always difficult to apply scripture. Because once you say some elderly people, in our culture, if elderly people say something, and even when they are wrong, and you are still saying otherwise, you are considered to be rude. You are considered to be, you have, you know, I like Bono. I don't know how to put that. <laughs> you are heady or something like that. That's the way they, they put it. So that's the first problem. Second problem is that there will still be many victims to this guy. So in the first case, I don't know how the situation was handled, that now brought elders to the situation. But if such situation should happen again, I would say avoid getting people's attention. Just get the perpetrator either arrested. See, sometimes we don't really get justice. But you see, the act of dragging people on that line puts them in check that someday, somehow, I could end up in jail. But Allah, your hands are raised up. Maybe you want to help me out, or you have? Uh, yes, yes. So I just want to kind of uh, contribute to um, oh. you know uh, the, the conversation, and yeah. I, I think it's important for us to look at it in in the light of exactly how uh, James put it. Yes. You know, a lot of times um, you know, people sometimes may intervene or beg, um, you know, based on cultural norms and all that. But I think if we look at it from another perspective. When you look at uh, somebody's conscience, a person may feel a little prick when they do something back the first time. You know, nothing happens. They do it again the second time. Nothing happens. And then ultimately what happens is their conscience becomes seared. They don't even you know, feel anything bad. And as a result, they continue to perpetrate the evil. And actually, it doesn't always get better. They always go worse. So, which means if he, you know, if he probably defrauded somebody today and nothing happened, no consequence, nothing happens to him, 
in the future, he may snatch a vehicle at gunpoint. Yep. So if we look at things in that perspective, sometimes I think it will help us to be able to make that tough call. You know, one thing I see in Western society that is a bit different uh, from, from Africa is, even if it is a parent, and I've, I've seen, uh, you know, um, cases that they've shown, for example, on TV, where uh, they put out um, a sketch of somebody that committed a crime, and it is actually that person's parent that called the, uh, the police to say, I, I think this is my son. Yeah. Now, if anybody did that back home in Nigeria, yeah. oh, they will reel all kinds of things that, oh, it's not a good parent. But guess what? Actually, that it, it's a very tough decision to make. But in, if you look at it at the end of the day, it will help everybody. First of yeah. all, it will stop that person from continuing to perpetrate what they are doing. Because sometimes, you know, people do things, they don't see anything bad in what they've done. It will give that person an opportunity to actually rethink their own actions and actually see it in the light of what it truly is. Yeah. Also, it will stop other people in society from becoming victims. I mean, how would you feel, you know, for example, just to maybe use uh, this uh, example that uh, uh, our brother is giving. If, you know, you let it go and you don't see anything, but, and then you find out later that he actually snatched a vehicle from somebody and yeah. actually ended that person's life. You know, you will feel so bad. So, I mean, it's not to say that one should um, report. I, I think as you said, um, whatever one feels, you know, uh, God is leading one to do is important. Uh, but I think motive is very important. If one is reporting just to take revenge because it took money, obviously, you know, that's not what God wants us to do. Yeah. But if the heart that we have towards this is that we want this person to stop being evil, yeah. you know, we want him to, to earn, there is dignity in earning a decent living. There is a blessing that comes with it. If that is what we truly want for that person, and we want, you know, because he has defrauded somebody now, the next yeah. person that he defrauds may not be so kind. That person may take his life. Yeah, so absolutely. If that, yeah. Is our, if that is our motive, that we are trying to make this person to see the error in their ways so that they can change. I think, uh, in my opinion, it is a good reason to yeah. report them or at least to find a way to make them see the error in their ways. So keeping quiet is not, I know in a way with company is always kind of like the country, especially when elders get involved. And that is why people continue to get worse. Awesome. Why? Because there is no consequence for bad behavior. Thank you very much, sir. All right, I have two more people that will comment now and we'll continue. Sister Anne. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, in context of um, the scripture that says that, um, okay, when a brother sins against you or commits um, offense, let's say it's a crime, that uh, instead of going, taking it to a, the court legally, taking it up legally to unbelieving judges. Can, can you open that place for us, man? Resolve it among yourselves. Can you open it for us? I don't have the scripture now. But okay, I, I just, just hold on, pause. Mommy, tell will go ahead. I will come back to you. Let me open it. Okay, Mommy, tell um, go ahead, uh, Brother Ola, can you hear me, please? Brother Ola has said it all. Oh, okay. You know, Colin, Calling elders to this kind of thing is very difficult because it's very confusing. There's no more elders in Nigeria. Most of them are, are, are fake because maybe the boys, the boy, the man concerned is doing them some kind of, some kind of something. So they back him up. Yeah. There's no more elder in Nigeria. The best bet is for you to, to teach him lessons so that they will not be able to do the same again. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very there, much. There's Bible for it, but I don't know the Bible of it now. Okay, thank you, ma. So, Sister Anne, your question is in uh, Matthew chapter 15. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, sorry. And let me read. If, you, if your Bible has topical edits, it says correcting another believer. So, and it says correcting. It's not really about crime. But let's look at it. If a believer sins against you, so what kind of sin can a believer sin against you? The Bible really didn't say commit a crime, 
But let us even take it that that is a crime. It says, go privately and point out the offense. So when we look at it from the context of this, even the believer might not really know that he has sinned against you. Is there from the man that took your money and he knows that he has taken, he didn't offer the service and took, you don't need to go and point out the offense. I gave you money to fix my car. You didn't fix my car. There is nothing to point out. It is glaring. So I just want to read this so that we understand that. But in the case of collecting a believer, um, it says, go to them, point out their offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won the person back. But remember, it says correcting another believer. So if you speak to them, brother, you did this. Uh, this is the way it is according to scripture. And uh, you, 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 the person agrees with you, you won the person back. But if you are successful, go back with another witness, two or one or two other people, so that they can be a witness to this. But still, in the light of what James is saying and what we've been discussing, he didn't say leave the person to continue. Don't leave the matter. Go back with another two people. Now, if he doesn't accept, call the whole assembly. It's still on the same matter. He has not gone to offend somebody else. So this is the way we are to, even are correcting someone among ourselves, don't give them the opportunity to do the same, to sin against another brother. Hold on to the matter. And you know, you can't force anybody to take correction. And that's why it says, if he doesn't listen to you, go with one or two witness. If he's not listening, bring the person before the church. And what you will do after you bring them to the church. If the person still refuses, take your case to the church. If they won't accept the church decision, teach the person as a pagan, as a non-believer. So however the church will decide to treat a non-believer, let them decide. All right, uh, we're going to continue. Sorry, Mr. Peters. Uh, I only wanted to take two people because we have a little more to cover, but I will come to you uh, shortly. Oh, come on, sir. Uh, sir. I just, um, I just uh, came in and uh, I, I got into this message, but uh, my question is this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, pull it back. So my question, I'm sorry, my question is this. My question, you know what, I'm sorry, con continue. Con All right, so let's, let's continue. So we must make sure that um, we do not, God is a God of justice. That's why in the Western world, prisons are really called correctional facilities, is to bring correction to people. And we must make sure that, and we need to, and this is why, uh, just to digress a bit, when I look at the nation Nigeria, which most of us are from, except with few exceptions, I don't see Christianity. I don't see believers among us because everything is upside down. But God will help that mission. All right, so let us continue. Now we've uh, talked about uh, justice, love, liberty, without mercy, and how mercy rejoices over judgment. So, <coughs> Uh, Brahla mentioned something which is also in my notes. He said, the nature of Christianity is forgiveness and not retaliation. It's to seek justice and not personal vengeance. Uh, forgiveness brings freedom from bondage to those who would produce a better spirit. So uh, let us focus on helping people by correcting them or putting an end to uh, the evil they are perpetuating. Some people, you might think that they can't help themselves. They're in bondage to sin. And do you think the only way where that bondage can be broken is by exposure? Expose them. That's the only way they can be free from it because it is in secrecy that the devil uh, takes his strongest hold in the life of people. Yeah, if you can do something in secret and get away with it, trust me, you will keep doing it over and over until the day you are exposed. 
So let us keep that at the back of our mind. Can you read that again, please? I didn't get it. Uh, okay, my note, I said the, uh, the nature of Christianity is forgiveness. Uh, uh, the Christian does not retaliate, but forgives. Uh, forgiveness brings freedom from bondage. And what I was saying is we don't do anything out of, I want to get revenge, but it is out of, I need to help this person out of stealing by getting him corrected by the uh, rightful authorities of the law. Uh, uh, like the man that took uh, money, it is scriptural to get him arrested because he's going to do somebody else. Uh, we mustn't treat things uh, through the high of culture. If our culture is warped, that's why in the Western world, they leave out scripture more than just carrying Bible in their hands. Uh, because they've done a good job long ago to make the Bible practical into their lives and it's almost been engraved into their mindset, the way they are taught, the way everything is done. Uh, with the, the exception are the ones that will commit crime, that will lie, that will cheat, but the norm is for everybody to behave rightly. So now James chapter two, we are going from verse 14. So verse 14 to 26 is addressing faith without good deeds is dead. That's what the whole is addressing. We're going to start today. We're going to wrap it up next week. We will do a quick review next week as well, because next week we are running up James chapter 2. Now I'm going to read from verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters? If you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? It's a question that is being asked. But you see, the answer to these questions are negative. Uh, Sister Han, are you raising up your hands? I was just um, trying to... Um like um, seek the difference between vengeance and um, just now. Sorry, vengeance and justice. Justice. I don't know, I have to, uh, we, first, uh, we first need to find a dictionary to define vengeance and justice. So hold on a sec. Vengeance about, uh, is about uh, taking your revenge. Justice is doing the right. So vengeance can be the same thing as a. Uh, so Christians, we don't take vengeance. In a, yeah, justice. but in a, in bringing someone to justice, sometimes I, what what I'm trying to say is that I think there should be a, it's a matter of a motive for pushing for justice. Uh, maybe the the motives could push towards vengeance. Let the person suffer for what he has done to me. See, which, which in other words could be like a vengeance. If you want think, somebody to face justice because I want the person to suffer for okay. what the person has done to me. Now I get what you're saying. When you look at it just from your point of view, that, that when you are, you want to get people locked up for what they have done to you, you're only thinking about yourself. But if you, if you look at the way when I was explaining it, I said, for the sake of the next person, even the person committing the crime for his own life's sake, is why you must seek justice to get him help. Because the next guy could just come with a gun and shot him dead. There's a video I saw about a week or two now. Neighbors were arguing on the street. Husband and wife, it was a snowy day. We we're arguing with their neighbor. And they were telling him, F war, do this. The guy went inside, shot them with pistol. They were still on the floor um, uh, in pain. He went back to bring a rifle and shot them dead. The camera of their own house captured it. You see, two things. I don't know the full story, so nobody should, should try to expand this. The people are abusing their neighbor. They would have been abusing other people before. Everybody have left them. 
Maybe this other guy now has mental problem. He can't undo people running in with their mouth. He didn't have time to argue with his mouth. He brought out a gun. If somebody had shut them down with words or reporting them as public nuisance, their life could have been spared. That other guy that came with a gun, he must have been brandishing gun and people must have neglected him. If somebody has said that this guy has psycho, he shouldn't have a gun. Let's get him help by getting police. Maybe he would not have killed his neighbor. He killed husband and wife. So, see, I would just say, well, if you think that for yourself is okay, do it. You know, like I said, we are not only speak, but please, you are just looking, just look at it for the sake of the criminal and the next victim. I think when you look at it from that place, you're not thinking because we are thinking for what he has done to you. He's not, you are not the first person and you won't be the last. So please let us keep that at the back of our mind. Let's, uh, yes, sir. Uh, something in March 18, 21 and 22. But Allah will come back to you. Go ahead, Brayro. Uh, something in March 18. Yes, sir. I think uh, 21 and 22. We're talking about how many times you can forgive 70. A brother. Yeah. A Christian brother. A believer. Well, do you actually specify a believer? Uh, Matthew 18, believe? let's go there. From verse 15, he talks about correcting a believer. By the time you get to 21, he talks about parable of the unforgiving debtor. See, when you don't, yes, okay, so let me read. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sinned against me? Someone. Not, no, not 70, not seven times, Jesus replied, yeah. but 70 times seven. Yeah. Verse 23 now says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decide to bring his account up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtor was bought, was brought, was brought in, who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and children and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down and begged his master, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. But the man who left the king went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, be patient with him and I will repay if he did, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had that man arrested and put him in prison until the debt be paid in full. You see, this even is explaining uh, mercy that we talked about before now, that if you don't show mercy, you won't obtain mercy. And this is about somebody owing you money. A person owing you money has not really committed a crime in terms of someone that needs to be prosecuted because he came to borrow and you gave it yourself. So, and I think we should be careful not to bring um, crime as someone offending you. They are not the same thing. Let, let us, please, crime is somebody doing something uh, either intentionally or unintentionally to harm you. It's a crime. And however it is defined, a crime is a crime. So somebody, uh, I can say to Sister, Permit me, Sister Francisca, shut up. Uh, I've sinned against her. But have I committed a crime against her? No. And I'll call her tomorrow, Sister Francisca. So I'm so sorry. Eh? I'm, uh, I've offended you. Oh, yeah, my sister, please. Sorry. Even if I didn't say that, she could call me and say, you know, it was rude for you, Charles, to have told me to shut up. I'll say, oh, really? I didn't know it was rude. 
Then she calls Pastor Eligi and they both come. I still refuse this. Then they say, okay, let us tell everybody here that this guy did not know his meat again. It's different from uh, you gave me money to give San Francisco and I chop it. The moment I spend it, I've committed a crime. I've obtained by trust. You see this Matthew 18 that um, Bonairo led me to read now is something that I did business transaction, I put this on recording, with people that failed, serious money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I hold it to them, which I haven't paid. There's another brother that he was in their need and borrowed $5,000 from me. And then I had money, I didn't even think twice, I gave it to him. You know, every time I go to ask him for my $5,000, I'm not asking him like I want to run him down because I always remember, I also hold people and they're not grabbing me by the throat. Each time, even my wife reminded me that, oh, has this brother even paid? I'll say no, that I spoke to him. And it's true, I'll, I'll do speak to him. But I didn't go crazy. I could rain insult on him because he borrowed. Those are the ones I could claim that, oh, I became to invest money and the business didn't work right. But you see, I'm not saying this because I'm a righteous guy, no. Is it difficult? Very difficult. Because he borrowed the money from me. I didn't transact. He said, you pay me interest. I said, I'm not interested in interest. Just give me my money, please. I told him, the time you I borrowed you money, rate was $180 to one Canadian dollar. Now it has doubled. So even if you give me, if you decide to give me Naira, you devalue my money by 50%. So you must give me back dollars. It's dollars I gave you. But you see, it's difficult. If I say it's not difficult, I'm lying. But the truth is, we just have to allow the scripture to be our guide. Sister Francisca. We are still on what we are talking about. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm not in a hurry. Let us, let I us. I just wanted to say that um, if you are the one being offended, either uh, the person committed a crime or just offended you, it will take the grace of God for you to think about the person first, the good of the person first, before yourself. I think it would need some time to process it. You will not even consider the person as in trying to act like maybe calling the police so that that person will be corrected and not cause another harm. I mean, that would not come to you immediately. Absolutely, you're right. You are saying it's a difficult situation, and I think it will need some time to process it. So maybe the best option is to uh, separate yourself from that uh, situation for a time so you can think and then be able to come up with the right thing to do. But if someone acts, reacts immediately, that would not be the first option to think about the other person's good. Yes. <laughs> In fact, yeah, it will depend on the crime. Oh, if it's a oh, crime that requires, oh, oh, hold on, ma. Oh, sorry, ma. The the perfect scenario to deal with this, and um, based on what you said, is when I said if an arm robber comes into my house, I don't want to be harmed. I want to get police. Once you're done, number one, within five minutes, they'll be here. It's just to get this guy away, not to harm me. After that time, I have right to go to the police according to the law of the land to ask about the person arrested. Now, if I now begin to follow up and they say that hey, he's going through trial, maybe we're going to, uh, yes, a psychological problem. And they say, no, 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 we can't have a psychological problem. He's a criminal, he must be, he must be put in jail. By the time I'm beginning to say that, I'm beginning to just consider my pay. No, this is not immediately again. Maybe after third day. But as believers, we should shift away from, and that's why most of the time, we don't even want to hear that. Is this person sick? We don't want to consider state of mind. We just want to say, he has offended me. 
let us shut him down. But you see, when I talk about the law of liberty, we should remember, and I'm going to repeat what I said on law of liberty. It does not work against the law. And it doesn't give us accurate answer for every situation. How to help someone, what to use to help them, the Bible does not dictate those pinpoint to us. It only gives us, so that's why we have the law of liberty at work in our life. We are the one to decide. What we have control over is the fact that I am going to offer help. If I offer someone $5 that is hungry, it is helpful, they can eat with $5. If I offer them $20, they can also eat with $20. So it doesn't, the amount and how, and instead of giving them the dollars, I might be worried that they're going to use it to smoke marijuana. And I go to buy the physical food and give to them. I have still helped. How? The means the Bible does not always dictate to us. But two things Bible always point to that is glaring. Somebody naked and somebody hungry. That don't overlook them. Even we're going to come to it in this same uh, James that we are reading from verse 14. It talks about you see a brother that is hungry, that is naked, or a destitute. Your goal should be to offer either clothing or food. Don't just say to them, oh, it is well with you and go. The Lord bless you. I can see your faith is still standing. So we can't really play scenario because it is easy to play scenario until it happens to you. Not the way we talk, talk about things and, pray and say, oh, you know, you should have done this. It's because you were not in the emotion of the moment. If you were, you, you will not be able to dictate your reaction. But you see, after, when you now begin to think about it, what is your thought? Why do you want to do what you want to do? If you want to now press, like I said about my pastor, when his son was killed, they have two options. They can, if they don't do nothing, insurance company will come, come and pay them uh, what is in the insurance policy of the guy for loss of life, in the operation of a motor vehicle, they will pay them compensation. The law on itself will put the guy in jail, take away his driving for some time, driving license, and things like that. Now, pay attention to this. They can hire a lawyer to search history about the guy. If the guy comes from a home, from a family that they are very rich, they can sue the guy for $5 million. They can be pressing charges that they want him locked up for 10 years. So the family now will not be begging him, begging them for money. So could you see the difference in the situation? But this is not a decision you make the day the event happened. The decisions you will make after. So if they now begin to do search, hire a lawyer to search, oh, it comes from a rich family, let us get more money it has now shifted into greed. So uh, let us just uh, trust God and always just make sure that we are not seeking self. And when I mean we are not seeking self, I will keep repeating, don't condone crime. Anywhere crime is committed, please let your first reaction be law and authority. I know it doesn't apply so much to people living in the nation called Nigeria, because even the person that commits crime, if he asks money to give police, they will arrest you that has been, that he committed the crime against and leave the guy. Or they tell you, first bring money before you can report the case. You know, so please, it's a falling word. And we must know that as long as we're in this act, all the evil that affects everybody else in this world, we are going to be part of it. You want peace? You want tranquility? You don't want any trouble? There's only one place available for you, and it is heaven. But I don't want to go there now. I don't know about you, but we shall all meet there one day. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. I think this this James is a practical book, so it's not a book that you can just share. It's a it's a life scenario book. That's what I'm saying. For example, so don't don't worry. Don't, there's no rush. Either way, either we continue now or next week. We are going to finish next week because the whole of 14 to 26 is addressing one case, and the case is about living out your faith. So, do we have any question on this again? Because we keep coming back, but let's let's deal with it. Any comment? Any concern? Yes, Brola, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just very quickly to add to what you just said, um, I think if we if we look at uh, the criminal justice system, it tells us something about how um, uh, they look at criminals when they charge criminals to court. They don't charge them based on the crime that they committed against one person. They always say the people versus the criminal, mm -hmm. the people. So in other words, that crime actually was committed against society. Um, if the issue is not addressed, other people, other law abiding citizens in society may become victims. So I think if we look at it also from that perspective, again, I think as you said very eloquently, um, the objective is not that we want to seek revenge. You know, he took my money, I'm going to show him, you no. Know, but that other people who may not even have as much financial resources available to them, don't end up getting defrauded as well. You know, let us quickly apprehend this guy. And maybe in that process, he may come to the realization that what he has done is not good and will stop and he too can actually end it decently, just to kind of give an example. So I think if we look at it in that perspective, you know, they always say the people is the people, not just the person that is the victim, but the people. Thank you very much, sir. All right, let's do James 14 to, I think 16, we're gonna to start today on 16, I think, because there is something I really wanna talk on today which is also related to what we've been talking about. You know, we've looked at it from the area of crime. Now we're going to look at this in the area of doing good. So keep all these our conversations at the back of our, your mind because the next set of uh, scripture we're gonna read is gonna be helpful to us. Uh, we go back to James chapter two and verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions. What good is it? Is it good or not good? We'll consider. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Hmm. We shall consider that as well. That's a second question. Now, verse 15, now start with a scenario. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm, eat well but you don't give them, but you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? What good does that do? So I want us to consider this um, because it says, verse 17 now says, so you see, faith by itself isn't good enough unless it produces good deeds it is dead and useless. So um, let me talk about my points. And you know, I said that we've looked at the scenario of how to deal with area of crime. Now, how do we deal with area of help? Why did James only talk about two scenarios? Suppose you find a brother or sister who has no food or clothing. Are these the only need of human beings? Let us consider. So, um, the answer to verse 14, they are negative. Because faith without works is no good. It does no good to anybody. And also, the question in verse 15, also still does not give anybody any good. But let us look at the scenario. Um, John, in 1 John 3, 10 to 17, can somebody read that for us, please? It says that 
one cannot say he love God if he doesn't care for his destitute brother. But let somebody read that for us. First John 3, 10 to 17. First John 3. Yes. 10 to 17. King James I'm using. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 12, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel my brethren if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 16, by this we know love, because he laid down his love for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Thank you very much, Mark. In Luke 3, 11, John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. So why food and clothing? Remember in Matthew 6, when you start reading from uh, maybe 29, 30, Jesus is also laying emphasis on what to eat and what to wear. So are these the only two good that we should do? So let's pay attention to, to, to this. Uh, one of the things that is very necessary is things that are needful to the body. Like I was saying, if I see someone that is hungry, uh, the promise of daily bread does not mean eating in a five-star restaurant, but it's having a meal to eat. Mm. But if the goal is eating in a five-star restaurant, you might need to look into other places for help, not from a brother. Because eating in a five-star restaurant is not the absolute basic necessary that is needful to the body. It is luxury. I'm going to make a statement, and you might have a contrary opinion, but this is what I believe. And once I do it, I know I am good because I'm still helping. James identified the destitute brother as one who is in need of food and clothing. He is not talking about the one who will not work. The brother who cannot work, who can work, sorry but we know work is not to be fed. The church has no obligation to feed those who refuse to work with their own hands to support themselves. You see, no matter how much you cry, I don't give people money to pay private school fees of their kids. If you can't afford private school, put them in public school the best overall student in Ontario, 2018, was the daughter of a taxi driver in a Toronto public school. But you see, there are high school where you pay $50,000. What some people do not earn as annual salary, people are paying it in school fees. I don't have any objection to people paying school fees for their kids as long as you can afford it. I once had my kids in private school here in Canada too, but God gave me wisdom. I took them out myself. 
And the time I took them out, uh, I was not broke. And when I mean I was not broke, I was not broke at all. I was too loaded. I just felt it, it was not needed. And how did I come to the conclusion it was not needed? Because I look at it, by the time they would get to secondary school, can I pay $50,000 on a child? And I have three. And they will all meet. Even if they don't all meet in high school, two of them will meet there. So when I look at it, I can't afford it five years time. Let me not afford it today. Now, the case is a bit different in Nigeria when the public school system is broken, but there are still students there. And private school also get class. But if you can't afford the one your child is seeing, step them down. If you can't afford the BAS minimum, put them in public school. But I can assist you to eat. I can assist you for shelter. I can assist you for clothing. But I don't pay private school fees. It's my personal policy. I'm not saying you should do the same. And that's why I use the example of eating in a five-star hotel and buying you um, uh, food from dollar store. Or Tim Martins, those are what we get double double coffee and donut and get out. Just go. I hid that to myself. So, and I'm bringing this contrasting help because James is telling you BRS minimum, what is needful to the body. So you don't look at it that, oh, I just help somebody pay the million naira in house rent. Uh, I can't help somebody again with 50,000. If they can't afford a million naira house, why are they living in that neighborhood? They should go and step it down. Any believer that cannot support himself through his work should not be on luxury. So James is addressing minimum, BRS minimum, basic necessity of life. You now I said, we consider the area of crime. Even in the area of helping people, there is a way we must, because our goal is not to be a philanthropist, one. We are not going out seeking people to help. But as many as we come across, we help them. At the same time, we are not to expend all our resources on one channel and left others bleeding. So we need to be good custodians of God's resources available to us. So that's why James is addressing basic necessity, needful to the body. We don't really want to know how they come about how do you come about being naked or not without food? But the goal is, before you even try to find out what is going on, provide clothing, provide food that they can at least eat. Because when you just say to them, it is well with you, we should have something. And don't, uh, we should also not get to the habit of Expending all our resources in doing good. We should always remember there is always a next person. Save a little for the next person. Uh, the common term among Christians to use is don't become Mother Teresa. That only herself puts scars on herself, but put all her money towards others. That was just her mode of dressing. It's not that she was poor. She had resources and she chose to use it to help the poor. So uh, do we have any comment on this? Please, that is my personal position. I talked about how I make decision on helping people. You have Holy Spirit, you are God's children. It is up to you. As the Bible did not dictate to us exactly pinpoint how much and how, I am also not imposing 
how and how you should do things. Any question, comments, concern? Paul the Apostle, so it's not like uh, we are against people. Let us read Acts chapter 20, verse 34 and 35. Acts 20, 34 and 35. And I will go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. I'll read downwards. Uh, let me quickly read 2 Thessalonians verse chapter, chapter 3. I'll read from 6 to 15, really. It's a long read, but let's quickly read it because it explains this. Uh, and the Topical heading on my NLT Bible says, an exhortation to proper living. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and do not follow the tradition they receive from us. For you know that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night, so we would not be a burden to any of you. We certainly had the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet, we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work, and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them to urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so they will be ashamed. Don't Think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. You see, the Bible is too, uh, it, it gladdens my heart sometimes, the way the Bible addresses things. Say, don't consider them as enemies. Say, don't, don't give them food because you know, this guy, not that there is really no job, but he felt that uh, he couldn't really do this one. Uh, uh, but they are not your enemies. They are still a brother and a sister, but you know, uh, keep them at arm's length. Yeah. Uh, Acts 20, who is reading for us? 30, uh, Acts 20, 34 to 35. Anybody? I will jump there quickly. 34 to what? Acts 20, 34 to 35. Okay. Okay. All right. You know that this hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. All right. I think on this note, uh, we're gonna wrap up today's teaching and next week by the grace of God, we conclude on James chapter two uh, we take it from 18 to 26. Uh, see, in all, we need wisdom to live in this world, to live the life of Christ. We need wisdom. Do we have any contribution today? Any comments, concern, or disagreement? No disagreement. <laughs> In the area of crime, we're all talking, but now everything's okay. Brian Jesulova. Yeah, okay. Hello, everyone. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Uh, sorry for what happened the other time. Um, I have a question because that is something that is uh, I believe you know about it, and uh, Pastor Paul know a little bit about what I'm about to talk about. You see, we always talk about all these kind of problems. 
we always talk about it. But what you just said right now, spiritually, spiritually, there are people going through challenges, problems that they are not physical. They are not physical. When we talk in the area of thief, stolen things, there are people that are fighting battles that they cannot explain it physically. And most of these things, the reason why I'm saying this is that if you know that someone is doing evil in your family, spiritually doing evil, and you know that if you leave this person to continue doing it, should we say something or we should just keep quiet and allow them to keep doing the evil? I'm talking about the spiritual aspect of it. Okay, uh, quick, quick one, sir. Uh, spiritual evidence is not admissible in court. So what will you do? Okay, that is what I want to know. Because so what, truly, you don't go to court and say, you, you know, you know. Uh, okay, so in that case, nothing anybody can do, right? So, okay, you tell us, what can you, what do you want to do? Go and find the person physically? Cause the person to die. But uh, if, if you have the power to no, do so. If the person to die, the person is not going to die. We hey. need it. Those, those things are not working. God does not want anybody to die. Don't want them to die. <laughs> hold, hold, hold on, sir. Hold on, sir. I love what you say. Then those things are not working. So if they are not working, <laughs> just leave it. If, see, when you raised it, the first thing that came to my mind is if truly it is spiritual, it is what is revealed to us okay. that is beneficial to us. If it is not revealed, you know it is there, but it's not revealed, then why bother? Because when you begin to bother, you are giving yourself a second class headache. Mm. And if you know that causing them to die, they will not die, it's not working. Because just God does just live your life in Christ. Just continue to live your life in Christ. Let them continue to do their evil. Is the one you know. What about the ones you don't know? Uh, let, let, let me just uh, uh, say something. You see, uh, when you you, see, you you just be uh, giving your yourself attic, you can't prove most of those things when you say spiritual. Let me just give you this. When Balak hired Balaam to cause the Israelites, do the Israelites know about it? No, sir. So God does so many things behind you than all the worries you give yourself. They don't know about it. And uh, as hard as Balaam did, Balak and Balaam, as hard as they did, nothing that they said occurred. So uh, even when you are talking of these spiritual things, you yourself can't prove it. You just, it's a speculation. I have to run from speculation. You can't prove it. Thank you, sir. All right. Any question? Right, something jump on. Something jump at me. I said I've not read it before. When you quoted um, First John three. Yeah. First John three seventeen, NKJV. But whoever has this word, this word's goods, and sees his brethren, his brother in need, and shut up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide? In him, I think, brothers, we really need when I when this when you reference this today, it jumped at me, and um, we've been damaged. And thank God that you know, capitalismus is happening now, we are being reconstructed. Prior to now, when we talk about need, we don't see brother, a, brother, a brother's need as a need, we see the needs of the church, uh, the church go for the year, the need to do programs. But we don't see a brother as a need. But today you are talking about uh, practical love, practical faith that is uh, that is uh, evident in love. And this reference that you 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 referenced, I've read it before, but it's just so clear now that a brother in need is also in need, and it's a real one, and we can't walk away from it. The pastor is also a brother. So, but before we. Every 10 hundred people are meeting the needs of the pastor. Why one brother is there lacking? 
<laughs> so it's uh you know we can empty our account to redeem our pledge in church we can come out to show that um, they made a call for those who give sacrificial giving, but we are so blind to the real brother Not really. this next to us. We are so blind to that. But it's in the Bible. It's always been there, right? Any other question? Comment? I think I stop recording now, so we don't. James is interesting, huh? 